I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here at the World Architecture uh, WAF for the first time. Um, and I get to speak too, and I get to have Nigel Coates sitting on the front row ready to lob tomatoes at me. You've heard this all before anyhow, so. Um, so, what am I gonna talk about? Well, um, oops, it went forward one. What happened to my table? Oh, there it is, okay. Difficult for me to see. I'm not gonna do what everyone else has been doing and stare at that screen while I'm talking, so I promise you. So, um, this book is, this book, this talk is about sex. Um, and yes, I should, uh, this is, uh, since I live in America, I know that you have to give trigger warnings, so there will be some nudity in these slides and depictions of uh, architecture that is, uh, could be seen as very aggressive toward women, to say the very least. So that is the required trigger warning. All of this started uh, many, many years ago when I was a very junior assistant professor. And since I was the youngest architect in the room, I was told that I had to teach interiors. Nigel already talked about the way in which interiors are not taken very seriously uh, by most architects. And that was seen as a lower life form. So if I got it through, if I got through interiors, maybe I would be allowed to teach the noble discipline of architecture. And not only that, but I had to teach it at eight o'clock in the morning, which for me in those days meant vaguely somewhere around dawn. So I walk into my first classroom, and of course it's filled with 37 women, and one man who to complete the cliche turns out to be gay, and they'd all gone to their guidance counselor and said, I want to be an architect. And their guidance counselor said, you mean interior decorator, you little woman, you. And I thought, this is rather odd. And how has this happened? How did we get in this situation? A situation which then I thought was going to be temporary. That um, was a mark of the transition into the professional field of women and was going to be gone within 10 or 20 years. Little did I know that, yes, more than 50% of many architecture schools now ha have women in their lower classes. That goes down to 40%. That goes down to somewhere in the 30s in many graduate schools. By graduation rate, it's definitely in the 30s. Entry rates in both the UK and the United States are in the 20s into the profession. And how many uh, female architects in sole practice do you know who have achieved the kind of status that Zaha Hadid or Jeannie Gang have achieved, not very many. It's still an incredibly sexist profession. So how did we get here? Well, how we got here is that, as we say in English, the man-made world is made by men, and women have had to make their own places within it. Men for millennia have had the power and have therefore had the control of space and they have designed it according to their values, their perspectives, and how they think the world should be organized. Women have been imprisoned in these environments, have been caught within them, and only when they reached a certain socioeconomic status were they able to actually create a world within uh, the places that men had made. Now, the result of that is that architecture is a discipline that is thoroughly identified with male values, or what we think of as male values. I am not going to make any statement about biological differences or even uh, or any kind of inbred differences. I'm only going to talk about what culturally we associate with masculinity versus femininity, certainly in the Western world. And The Belly of the Architect, uh, Peter Greenaway's great movie about the hubris of architecture setting up in the front of the Pantheon with an obelisk added for good measure is sort of a mark of that. But more seriously than that, of course, everything about architecture is about creating monuments that are bigger than we are, that are more static, that represent great and enduring values. And in fact, 
ultimately, architecture is a game of potlash. Architecture is a way to take whatever surplus value you have, whatever you have robbed and pillaged and amassed from the rest of the world, and entomb it into a structure that you hope will be as permanent as possible and will outlive you, and with it, your name will outlive your physical being. And architects are complicit with this activity. The other activity of architecture is to then defend that great wealth against all comers. Let's not forget that Vitruvius, he's been cited several times in lectures already today, starts off his first, what we think of as the first book of architecture, with a dedication to the emperor that he will show him how to defend his cities against all comers. Architecture is a defensive activity, and yes, it is an activity of erection. I, I love showing Ledoux's uh, Oikome because it's just so perfect in terms of the way it sums up uh, the way in which architecture has panned out. For those of you that don't know the story, Ledoux designed two versions of utopian uh, community called an oikome, one before, one after the French Revolution, proposing that there would be this perfect environment built completely out of platonic solids and derivatives thereof. But, of course, the only people who would be allowed to inhabit this perfect world were men of a certain who had come of age because women didn't matter, they weren't really people, let alone people of color, anything of that sort. And how did you come of age? You would enter through the Propylaea, you would come into the great gathering salon, you would be washed and laid and prepared, and then you would go into the shaft where in each of the little cabins a nameless and of no import woman would deprive you of your virginity, and you would then come out to the uh, oval salon at the end, being now a real man, and be spewed out into this perfect utopian world. That might be an extreme example, but certainly this notion that you are going to make the biggest prick that you possibly can is bred into the architecture profession. And I often wonder whether that's why so many architects are such big pricks, but that's a whole other question. Um, the, sorry if I'm insulting any architects here. If you take it as an insult, maybe you should wonder why you feel as if I'm speaking to you. Um, beyond that, in a more abstract way, of course, the whole notion is that you're abstracting, you're abstracting the world through architecture. You're turning it into a rational f field that can be plowed and used, and you are using it as a place to exercise your power. And no place is this, again, more beautifully summed up than with this one of the many uh, illustrations of the Vitruvian Man, except that this one uh, is rather aroused, and in fact the caption says that this shows the male virtues that are impregnating the fertile round earth, with a female pronoun, with its ge uh, genius and creativity. And of course, next to that, Michelangelo's slaves uh, struggling against their materiality. Architecture seeks to be a way to escape the world, to be abstract, to be permanent, and to rule over that world. And within that world, women are only there as objects of pleasure, objects of contemplation, objects to be caught within the structures that architects have made for themselves. Architecture, therefore, is not just the play of pure forms in light, it is the creation of an abstract, monumental world that is meant to escape from physicality and to act as a defensive and memorial device. That is, those are the essential properties of architecture. The problem, of course, is that makes it a fairly alienating activity. I hate to break it to all of you who I assume most of you are architects, but most people out there hate architecture. I have found this over and over again when I try to write about it and teach about it. Most architects, most people think of architecture as everything that is alien and imprisoning 
and that turns them into what Heidegger would have called standing reserve, into just so many people caught in Dilbert land. Architecture does not have a very good reputation, especially when architects continue to try to build every tower of towers in which they imprison us, which are reserved for the wealthy, and which replace the world around it with their scheming and gleaming, glimmering nothingness. Beyond that, of course, there is a more fundamental problem, which is that outside of the citadels of the 1% of the 1%, most of the rest of us, not architects, because architects are very conservative, but most of real people out there live in the suburbs, live in this amazing world of sprawl where by now 60% of all Americans live, and I believe the figure is close to 40% of all uh, English people and growing in every area. There's an argument that can be made that right here in the Netherlands, almost 100 people, percent of the people live in sprawl because the whole country uh, has been built as a general grid wrested from the sea and the rivers. And in this world of sprawl, the grand idea of this democratic grid that was somehow contain us but also give us possibility has metastasized into this cancerous growth that contains these boxes made completely of artificial material where we close ourselves in away from the weather, away from others, and plugged into our televisions and everything else we have. And the grand ambitions of a Palladian architecture that will ennoble us and monumentalize our lives has turned into just so many ducks inscribed on the same stucco and wood framework, or in Europe, brick and concrete framework. And it has, in fact, produced what Jürgen Meyer last year at the Chicago Biennale uh, in his Latte Manifesto pointed out is a world of brownness for which you could also use another simile. It is, uh, in fact, a world, I did a survey once with my students and we found out that every building had some attempt to clothe itself in a piece of architectural style, but every building also ranged from light brown to light ochre with some yellows mixed in, and that was about the range of everything you saw. And of course, what this produces is this completely alien landscape, which is even more frightening when you know that in these Joel Sturfield photographs, you're looking at sites where murders took place that, of course, are completely anonymous. Uh, a world that is completely unreal and in which we might, in fact, just be dreaming what we're doing now as we are being sucked of our vital bodily fluids by some giant alien life force and where the true controller of what is going on in our world is not architecture, but are the security cameras that are controlling our lives everywhere. So, not such a great world we've built for ourselves. As Frank Gehry famously said, 98% of what's out there is, I won't, I'll try to be polite since I've already cursed once, uh, but it, in my mind, I think that might be an underestimation. We have really, messed up our environment in a horrible way. It's a little bit difficult to be saying this in Amsterdam South, which is one of the few islands of really beautifully produced architecture, but it's in that 1%. Most of what we built is horrible and getting worse. So the question is, how do we get out of that? And I propose that there was actually a counter movement at that very beginning of architecture, a counter movement which looked at an architecture that came out of the elaboration of nature, that understood that architecture started not with tombs and pyramids and temples, but with tents, with the weaving together of nature to create portable extensions of the human body that turned into a gathering place for a community, a way for the human being to become part of a larger, mobile, temporary community, and also that the very first urban settlements were not these great citadels that protected themselves, but were actually sprawling and open uh, concatenations of dwellings like Katahuyuk in, in Anatolia, 
uh, which was a matrilocal and matrilineal society that had no central monumental focus and, as far as we can tell, was rather democratic in his setup. And so it turns out that the evil that happened somewhere around two and a half millennia ago was that men took over, raped all the women, subjugated them, started making the architecture that we today adore. And in so doing that, they, as I said, imprisoned and entombed women. And it led to this split that Svetlana Alpers has described, and I have deliberately misread, as the difference between northern and southern modes of picture making. She points out that when Alberti talks about great architecture, great art, he describes it as a window into another world where you're seeing an ideal world that you can never enter, the world of the Bible, the world of the gods, that is perfect but not you. However, in the north, in the Netherlands, the model becomes the mirror where the world as it is is given back to you, where what you see is the world that you inhabit miniaturized so that you can handle it and understand it, perfected through technology and craft, including that of painting or of architecture, and turned into a completely and thoroughly knowable and comfortable world, a world of contemplation, a world of sensuality, a world in which women actually play the leading role, albeit only women of the middle class and only women within the framework that architecture has established. And that world, I would argue, which of course is the world of the interiors, begins to appropriate and eat out the security, the rules, the regulations of architecture and creates a situation in which the wealth, the beauty, the comfort, the reason why you have a big house is not its exterior, but is the interior. And the interior becomes the locus of invention, of change, of bringing together the whole world into a place where you can enjoy it, can understand it. It allows for multiple people to work out how they want to live, to get more and more mass-produced goods, and to create environments that are sensuous and sensible, that work, that make sense, that are places that we actually want to inhabit. However, there are also worlds that are tent-like, temporary, changeable, can always be something completely different. They are places that use quite often minimal means, and they are places that are dedicated to culture, which is to say to the elaboration of the social relations that bind us together and allow us to understand where and who we are. They create what one critic has called an artifactual literacy out of all of the objects that are there. And in these kind of spaces, as they become more and more professionalized, we begin to see technology and all the grand new forms that are invented and celebrated in architecture here domesticated, quite literally, and made available. And as that happens, the interior, of course, begins to fall apart and become more and more uncertain until it turns out, turns into just a fragment cantilevered over what Rainer Banham called the Plains of Id of Los Angeles, but still caught within this architecture. Here in this famous photograph by uh, Schulman, these two ladies sit delicately but uncertainly perched in their cocktail dresses while the whole grid of the house and of the sprawl beyond them contains them, and even worse, because interiors were done often by self-trained women, by women in general, it was never taken seriously as a discipline, never developed 
much of its own historical constant, uh, consciousness, despite Peter Thornton and various other people trying to very hard. And as a result, the general state of especially the domestic interior is probably even worse than the current state of architecture with this one difference that you can actually live, as long as you wear dark enough sunglasses, fairly comfortable in the kind of shit that interior designers today produce. So what this led me to do after I wrote this book in 1993 uh, called Building Sex about this strange situation was to say, okay, how, again, how do we get here and where do we go? And I went back to Sebastiano Serlio in 1537 to 42, writing his books on architecture, which understood the metaphor, but also the organizing principle for architecture to be stagecraft. Architecture was not a way to sink your wealth, to make monuments, to defend yourself. No, architecture was a way to appear, a way to be in the world. And in his formulation, there are two kinds of architecture. One on the left is tragic architecture. Now, this is the architecture that actually matters and means something. And it is the architecture for tragedy which means that great heroes perform, and at the end, everyone dies. Because an actual human being is not important. What matters are timeless values and virtues. Against that is an architecture that is comedic. And it is an architecture made up of fragments of the past, a little bit of classicism, a little bit of thatched roof, a little bit of brick, a little bit of stone, a little bit of Gothic, a little bit of Romanesque all persisting and layering on top of each other, messing together to create a messy world in which people eat and sleep and go to the bathroom and have sex and talk to each other and do all the things that people do in normal life. Not meaningful, but real. Architecture, not architecture. Well, Cesario, there's actually a third way a third scene, and that is the satiric scene. The satiric scene is, of course, of satire, where you never quite know whether the truth is being told or not, where you have to know all of the other agendas to, to be able to figure out what is being performed. And the satiric scene takes place somewhere between the countryside and the city, in what we today might call sprawl, with the ruins of a past civilization or the building blocks of a future one, waiting for us to do something with them. And it is inhabited, of course, by satires, half beast, half human beings, or these days, perhaps, half SUV and half human being. And so I asked the question, where would that kind of a satiric scene come from? And I turned to what used to be very quaintly called the third sex, those people who ascribed neither fully to male or female values, who have to find their way in between the set rules and the focus on making the largest erection and the most monumental structure that is associated with masculinity, and the desire to be comfortable, but also to be enclosed, to be hidden, to be some place where they can be safe because, of course, I'm talking about gay men and women or what we today would call LGBTQ and whatever other letter we've added on to it uh, last week. So I specifically started looking at queer space. Now, what does queer space mean? So it means, first of all, the place where queer acts take place. And there's a very long history of that going back to my favorite monumental spaces of Roman and Persian and various other antiquities, which were the great baths, which were against the places of ritualized warfare of the arenas and the Colosseum, against the fora. These were the places where you came together to do business, to get to know each other, and yes, to have sex. These were the places where same-sex desire were carried out. And to this day, these bathhouses where architecture is present but dissolves, 
into this watery, nebulous area of steam and columns, of water and stone, of bodies that come together or stay apart, has been a major place for the development of queer space. Against that, of course, have been the places of enforced sexual separation, going back to the longhouses in uh, pre-verbal and pre um, written societies, the spaces of either prisons or of boarding schools where men and women had to have recourse to each other because they were separated from each other and where the actual fact of enclosure, which otherwise is dressed up with columns and made to think just to be grand, undresses itself as the pure exercise of power. It is, if you will, the location of a certain s and sexuality. And it is interesting that the very first historical record that we have of cruising, of men looking for other men, is right here in Amsterdam at the very first stock exchange. And the idea that the birthplace of modern capitalism is also the birthplace of cruising, to me, just throws up all kinds of interesting associations about what is so queer about capitalism itself. But maybe that's another lecture. Uh, Renier de Graaf and I could do one uh, on that together. Um, and it was in these kind of in-between spaces, neither outside nor inside, in the Passagen and in these kind of greenhouses that started appearing in the cities that cruising actually came up. And within these spaces or next to these spaces then also grew up places that were specifically dedicated to sexuality, spaces that were in the leftover parts of the city. And it's interesting that it is in the cracks in the remains, in the in-betweens, in the back alleys, and all the things that you're not supposed to see, but that are neither architecture nor interiors, a kind of somewhere nebulous word between those two, that these queer spaces began to occur. They also began to occur at the edges of the city, on the docklands, on the beaches, on the places where, like in the satiric scene, the urban environment and and the landscape became together. And I believe that, um, that Nigel is working on a whole project about these kind of environments. So we'll have to look forward to that being published soon. And with this, queer space begins to invade uh, the normal places of architecture and begins to bring sexuality right into the core of the urban environment. Cruising, and I'm realizing they, um, if I sound like I'm vamping, I am because I don't know where Fortula is, but this is not the right version of my talk. This is the older version, so you're going to, you're seeing a couple of things I didn't, I took out, and you're going to miss a couple of slides, so sorry about that. Um, cruising, parks, edges of cities, uh, and you're missing a very important slide. Uh, okay, well, I'll just talk around it. The other place that queer space begins to appear is in a completely different environment, which is when men and women begin to actually develop a personality that we begin to be able to identify as queer, because of course, the notion of homosexuality, of queerness, is a structure that grows up with capitalism starting in the 18th century, very difficult to define it. Before that, it is tied in not just with sexual desires, but with status, with economic power, with all these kind of issues, with a sociality. And one of the first great heroes of that story is, of course, William Beckford, son of the richest man in England, uh, who is excised from polite society after he's caught with one of his young nephews. And so he builds on the wilds of the Welsh countryside this giant fantasy land in which he tries to construct a completely different place for himself, a world that has its own history, 
that has its own interiors that, by the way, also has so many books that when he goes broke, those books become the basis for what later becomes the British Library. This incredible fantasy land that, of course, burns down in the end. And his counterpart in uh, Germany is Ludwig II, called Mad King Ludwig. Why is he mad? Well, because he doesn't do what men are supposed to do. And instead, he builds these great palaces where he invents a lineage for himself going back to the Bourbon kings and creates this completely luscious and luxurious set of places that culminate in this great grotto, which certainly is reminiscent of all those bathhouses, uh, from which he sets sail one dark night onto the lake and is never seen again, probably murdered by uh, the people who want to get rid of him. The third place where uh, queer space begins to show up and intersects with these other two spaces is in the particular queering of classicism and historical styles through the arts and crafts movement starting after John Ruskin writes to, uh, to Passive Art in, 1960, in 1862. The notion that what we need to do is create communities where we all come together and recreate the world rather than having it be mass produced by the factories and here C.R. Ashby who would cruise around the slums of London to bring together the most talented young men he could find uh, to create his own community to rebuild the world. And out of all of these um, strands comes a new architecture that begins to dissolve the certainties of form that begins to queer architecture into something much more decorative, much more fluid, much more elaborate, and a place where also interior and exterior come together, where forms become elongated, become emphasized, where things begin to droop, other things begin to sag. Uh, I think that Peter Cook might start talking about nutters. Well, here, nuttery had a purpose. Here were men, mainly, who could not come out, who had a completely different set of values, but were working as architects, and who brought those sensibilities into the deformation of architecture all the way up into the work of Louis Barrigan, with this incredibly sublimated sensuality built into his forms, or on the much more mundane level, the uh, deformation of standard house types from the grand to the small, and, of course, the elaboration of interior design into surreal environments to the point that it even escapes out of Le Corbusier's house and out of Bestigi's house and begins to occupy this strange area on the rooftop where it is an interior that now has also become a piece of architecture. And the history of architecture from the 1850s through the 1950s is filled with a series of men and women, women mainly interior design like Elsie de Wolf, men in architecture from Louis Sullivan and Plesnik through Barragan, through Paul Rudolph, Charles Moore, Philip Johnson, who queered one style to the other, queered historicism into Art Nouveau, queered modernism into postmodernism. What better example than Philip Johnson's erection of a giant pop art version of a piece of furniture belonging on the interior into the scale of a skyscraper, and then placing Golden Boy, who sat at the top of the original AT&T building, exactly on axis with the high-speed elevators so that all of the executives, as they were going to work, would have to look up his bum before they could go to about their business. Against that kind of expressiveness, there was the queerness of someone like Charles Moore, who, in fact, wrote a book called Place of Houses, in which he talked about bringing the lessons we have learned from interior interiors out into the world of architecture itself and bringing the world of drama and of stagecraft, like in that of Serlio here in a satiric landscape of the University of Cali California at uh, Santa Cruz creating Kresge College. And all of this, of course, happens also at the time when queer men and women begin to come out. 
Uh, here is the bed that Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns share together that now has become an artwork for everyone to see at the Museum of Modern Art. Here is the most expensive painting that, of a living artist, I think, is now the record, uh, Bigger Splash by David Hockney. And, uh, of course, all of that sensibility is now being seen as the very height of culture of imaging a world that is neither interiors nor exteriors, neither men nor women, that begins to fall apart around either of them. And at the same time, of course, the world of hustlers and the way they weave together the environment becomes a place uh, to look at. And all of this also produces a great queering of urban design instead of laying out these grids in which we all have to live in the little uh, boxes that architects have designed for us. Instead, we now get these communities that reproduce a home life in an artificial queer way and then extend out to create mu communities that become the engine for the renovation of the inner cities. All of that comes to a rather abrupt end uh, when, of course, the great AIDS epidemic uh, happens. And suddenly, uh, instead of taking over communities, uh, queers are taking over motel rooms to try to get their hands on HIV drugs. And with that comes this incredible <coughs> devastation of the queer community, which we commemorate today with monuments, but which also meant a kind of an end to the experimentation that was coming out of this century-long tradition of queer space. However, it was an end that was also caused by the assimilation of these sensibilities into uh, the mainstream world. To be queer today, I'm sorry to keep picking on Nigel Coates, but we were talking about the fact that it's, uh, you can no longer be a token queer because it's not seen as being of any importance anymore. Queerness is seen as being part of the world. Queers live in the suburbs. Queers' uh, values are now seen as something that many people embrace. Here's Catherine Opie documenting uh, her family of two mothers uh, at the football game and at home. And here's, of course, also what happens to queer porn, which used to be a statement of being outside and being somewhere else. Uh, now queer porn takes place in suburban homes, over a barbecue, uh, in a, a fashionable loft, uh, or at a, uh, see, these, you weren't supposed to see these, actually. I'm going by very quickly. I took them out. I thought they were too much. Or, of course, uh, they take place uh, in uh, this nebulous third world um, where gaming now takes place. And, of course, there is this new social construct that is being created out of uh, social apps and dating apps. Um, and I love this one where someone is sending their location and someone asks, what am I supposed to do with this? Because, of course, the problem now is that queer space is confronting the same problems of placelessness, of a set of social connections that have nothing to do with architecture or with comfort that everyone else is confronting. And some of the most interesting people working at the very edges of queer space are playing with these ideas and beginning to make an art and an architecture out of them. I'm showing here the work of Elm Green and Dragset, consciously playing on all of those traditions. In the end, um, I think that what we're now looking at is actually the queering of human beings and their environments into something that is so invaded and pervaded by technology that those distinctions make little uh, sense anymore. And here you were supposed to see this wonderful image of Alexander McQueen's project where uh, a uh, set of robots painted a dress, but you're not going to see that, I don't believe. No, so I'm just going to go very quickly because I'm running out of time. All kinds of ways in which new communities are being made, new realities are being built up. And what's fundamental about this is understanding that we need to rehabilitate our past, our memories, cherish them, and out of that sensuality create a new architecture. This is really upsetting because I am hereby losing...
the climax of my lecture. So I will fast forward, and if anyone wants to see the lecture that I uh, was supposed to be showing here, I'll be happy to show them uh, on my iPad uh, later, um, all the way through the work of Mark Faster Gage, uh, our, our current hero of queer space. And I will just end by showing you that we are trying to work on some of these things at Taliesin, where I have uh, the pleasure of directing students as they create their own shelters, trying to figure out what it means to be a body and to be part of a social construct in our modern world. Uh, and I would invite you all to come join us and take a look at what we're doing at Taliesin. Apologies that that got messed up, and thank you for your attention. I'll just do summing up, I think, because we've run okay. out of time. All right. Well, I think it's a masterly uh, presentation. Um, I'm sorry about the mix-up, and I'm sorry you missed your climax, Aaron. That's very, very unfortunate. Um, but the, um, I think that the issues you've raised, I haven't heard a lecture quite like that, which has been so co coherent about um, the historical nature of space making or space defining and how those tendrils have come through to the present day. And I think it's a very interesting point about what happens when, as it were, a version of the avant-garde becomes mainstream. Um, because then, of course, the attempt deliberately to continue it is it's either doomed to failure or something very odd happens to it because it's trying to... Um, it's trying to kind of reconcile the irreconcilable. It's trying to be secret and open, and it's trying to be dirty and clean, and it's trying to be kind of exclusive but not exclusive anymore. And I think that that, I think what, whatever work you're doing at Taliesin will be extremely intriguing about this because we must be on the cusp of some new forms and perhaps... Perhaps, as um, Rainier de Graaf was saying this morning, that we'll, we'll be able to look back on this period, so the last 30 years, um, as something between the 20th century and the 21st century, and who knows where that might take us in the decade to come. Aaron Betsky, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.